This program is brought to you by Emory University. My name is Philip Weiner. I'm the Vice Provost for Global Strategy and Initiatives at Emory and also the Director of the Hall Institute for Global Learning. I'm very pleased to welcome you today, here today for this event. It, this is one of the final events of Emory's 2015 India Week. For those of you familiar with Hala Institute programming, or for those of you who have attended uh, other uh, programming about India in the past, this year marks a, a significant departure uh, in, and, and a milestone in Emory's commitment to India. What began as the Emerging India Summit in 2010, created by a group of creative and innovative students, uh, and what then became a two-day uh, India summit has now evolved into a full week of programming, marking the sixth anniversary of the event's founding. The, through the passion, enthusiasm, and hard work of many students on the Student Planning Committee and through the Hala Institute, this week now offers events, keynotes, and workshops for expanded audiences, including students, Emory faculty, staff, and the wider Atlanta community. I'd like to have the members of the Student Planning Committee be recognized for their hard work. If you could please stand. Maybe they're outside. They're probably, oh, there. <laughs> Thank you. As many of you already know, Emory recently released a new global strategy that will guide Emory's global engagement for the next five years. As part of this new vision, Emory has identified five countries of strategic importance, and I'm proud to announce publicly that India is one of these strategically important countries for Emory. This expanded India Week is the perfect uh, manifestation of the energy that exists on Emory's campus around all things India, from students to faculty and from local to global partnerships with the Indian community and beyond. Speaking of local partnerships, I'd also like to publicly recognize the Indian Consulate in Atlanta and the outgoing Consul General, uh, Ambassador Ajit Kumar, for his steadfast support of Indian programming here at Emory. I've gotten to know, know Ambassador Kumar over my tenure, uh, during my tenure as Vice Provost, and have found his counsel and advice to be very helpful on a wide range of issues. In fact, if it wasn't for the advice and support of Ambassador Kumar and former Indian Ambassador Jai Shankar, we would not be here tonight to welcome Mr. Vikas Swaroop. Uh, please thank the Indian Consulate in Atlanta for their strong commitment to this relationship with Emory. <laughs> Without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Mr. Vikas Swaroop. Mr. Swaroop, we are, very, uh, sorry, we are very fortunate to have such a distinguished author and diplomat visiting Emory. Mr. Swaroop was born in Allahabad to a family of lawyers. He studied history, psychology, and philosophy at Allahabad University, where he graduated with distinction. After graduating from college, he joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1986. And as he rose through the diplomatic ranks, he served in Turkey, the US, Ethiopia, the United Kingdom, South Africa, and Japan. From 2009 to 2013, he served as the Consul General for Osaka Kobe, Japan. And in his current appointment, is, he is in New Delhi as the Joint Secretary of the United Nations Political Affairs Division. And this is just his day job. Mr. Swaroop is the author of the best-selling novel, Q&A, which he wrote in just two months, and which was the premise for the Oscar-winning movie, Slumdog Millionaire, which we're going to see tonight. Q&A was wildly successful in its own right, and it has been published in 43 languages, and won Mr. Swaroop the prestigious Booker Prize in 2006 in South Africa, and was shortlisted for the Best First Book Award by the Commonwealth Writers Prize. While many successful authors might stop there, Mr. Swaroop continued writing and has published two more best-selling novels, Six Suspects in 2008 and The Accidental Apprentice in 2013. Like Q&A, these books have garnered wide praise and are, are in the process of being adapted into films. In public lectures like these, he has often joked that his success was spur, has spurred a cadre of his peer diplomats to, take their, to try their own hand at writing fiction. Quite the legacy. Before we welcome Mr. Swaroop, I'd like you to invite you to save your questions uh, for the end, uh, and we'll, uh, he, he, he will speak to us. And then you'll have an opportunity to, to address questions to him. Uh, and then after that, we'll see the movie. Thank you for your patience. And let's give a warm Emory welcome to Mr. Vikas Swaru. Hey, 
It's an honor and a pleasure to be at Emory University. This is an institution that has incubated top business leaders, musicians, Pulitzer Prize winners, senators, ambassadors, astronauts, a vice president, and even a Miss America. <laughs> and the philosophy behind its success is chiseled, is chiseled onto the front gate of the Emory campus. A quote from the eighth president of Emory College, Atticus Haygood. Let us stand by what is good and try to make it better. I was struck by how apt this quote is to describe Emory's India Week, an annual event that celebrates the close bonds between India and the United States and tries to make them deeper, stronger, and better. So it's a real privilege to be a participant at the 2015 Emory India Week. And at the very outset, I would like to thank Mr. Philip Wainwright, Vice Provost for Global Strategy and Initiatives, Assistant Director Kevin Kelly, members of the Student Planning Committee, and the entire team at the Hall Institute for Global Learning for inviting me to Atlanta and providing me this platform to share some thoughts. And of course, to each and every one of you for coming here this evening. Now you've just heard me described as a diplomat and a writer. And that's because I have to wear these two hats of being a diplomat and of being a writer at the same time. But the two hats came on at different times. I have been a diplomat now for the last 29 years and a writer only for the last 10 odd. And the two roles are not entirely compatible. I mean, in the sense, a diplomat is supposed to be very nice and affable. Uh, the best definition of a diplomat is that a diplomat is someone who can tell you to go to hell in such a way that you actually look forward to the trip. <laughs> a writer, on the other hand, is supposed to tell it like he sees it without pulling any punches. So at times, there is an uneasy coexistence between these two split personalities inside my head. But then, as E.L. Doctorow said, writing is a socially acceptable form of a schizophrenia. So when exactly did I acquire this schizophrenia? In other words, how did I become a writer? Did I always want to be a writer? The short answer is no. I never had English literature as my subject, I have not been within 100 miles of a creative writing workshop. I was always a reader. And I'm glad that I lived in an era when there was no cable television, no internet, no Xbox 3, no PlayStation 4. For me, the best and only pastime was reading. And I read everything, from Munshi Premchand to Moby Dick, from Albert Camus to Alistair MacLean. As a young boy growing up in small town India, books were my passport to a larger world full of possibility and promise. Sitting in my armchair, I roamed the world, flitting from Chinua Achube, Chinua Achube, Achebe's tribal village of Umuofia in Nigeria to Gabriel Garcia Marquez's imaginary town of Mekondo, from Albert Camus' Algeria to Franz Kafka's Vienna. But despite all this reading, I never felt the urge to become a writer. I used to write in my school and college days, but I suppose everybody does. And the last thing I published was a short essay called The Autobiography of a Donkey in my school magazine way back in 1979. <laughs> I joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1986, and for 15 years, the thought of writing fiction did not cross my mind. It was only when I was posted in London between 2000 and 2003 that I first thought of writing a novel. Inspired by the city of London, which is such a hub for the world of English language publishing, and also by some of my friends in the Indian Foreign Service who were trying their hand at fiction. In fact, there are so many Indian Foreign Service officers who have written novels that people have even begun talking about a so-called IFS school of writing. Anyway, I began my debut novel, Q&A, in the summer of 2003. And believe it or not, I wrote this novel in just two months mainly because my wife Aparna and my two children had already gone back to India and I was all alone. So this led a friend to quip that sometimes behind a successful man, there is an absent woman. <laughs> of course, when I went for the Oscars, I discovered that in Hollywood, they do things differently. There the saying goes, behind every successful man, there is a woman and behind that woman is the wife. <laughs> so I wrote this book in two months and within three months of my finishing it, it found a publisher. And publishing, to my mind, remains central to the art of writing. 
There is a story about a very devout Christian writer who wrote 10 novels, but not one of them was accepted by publishers. He got so dejected that he hanged himself. When his soul went up to the pearly gates, St. Peter had a problem. You see, he had not read any of his novels, so he could not decide whether to send him to heaven or to hell. So he gives the writer a choice. Okay, you decide you want to go to heaven or you want to go to hell. The writer is a clever fellow. He says, first, I would like to have a tour of both the facilities. <laughs> so St. Peter says, okay, son, come. So as they descend into the fiery pits, because St. Peter is taking him to hell, the writer discovers row upon row of writers chained to their desks in a steaming sweatshop, writing longhand in thick registers. As they worked, they were repeatedly whipped with thorny lashes by demons. Oh my, the writer says, this doesn't look very good. Let's see heaven. A few moments later, as they ascend into heaven, the writer sees row upon row of writers chained to their desks in a steaming sweatshop, writing longhand in thick registers. As they worked, they too were being whipped with thorny lashes by demons. Hey, the writer says, this is just as bad as hell. Oh no, it's not. My son, says St. Peter, here your work gets published. <laughs> so Q&A was written in 2003 and it was published in 2005. It is the story of an 18-year-old waiter called Ram Muhammad Thomas who participates in a quiz show called Who Will Win a Billion, W3B, which offers the biggest jackpot on earth, a staggering billion rupees. That's almost 16 million US dollars. Unfortunately for him, the producers of the show are a bunch of cheats whose aim is to tempt and titillate you with the top prize of a billion rupees, but who actually have no interest and no desire of parting with that money. So the whole show is one elaborate cheat. So naturally, when this 18-year-old waiter from Jimmy's Bar and Restaurant in Mumbai applies to appear on the show, the producers don't bat an eyelid. They say, he's a waiter, how far can he go? So Ram Muhammad Thomas is allowed to appear on the show, and he's asked 12 questions, and he answers all 12 questions correctly. The producers of the show are stunned. How could this barely literate waiter answer all their tough questions? So they come to the only conclusion they could have come to, he must have cheated. So they promptly go and bribe the police, who go out and arrest Ram Muhammad Thomas. And when my novel opens, you have Ram Muhammad Thomas being tortured by Inspector Godbole in a police lockup and being forced to sign a confession statement. Suddenly, a young woman lawyer walks into the police station, quotes the law to the police, and takes him away to her house. And that evening, she asks him, tell me, how did you answer all those questions on that quiz show? So Ram Muhammad Thomas begins telling, uh, telling her the story of his life. And you have 12 chapters in my novel, just as you had 12 questions on the quiz show. At the beginning of every chapter, Ram Muhammad Thomas narrates a slice of his amazing life, and then you discover how that enabled him, how that life experience enabled him to answer that particular question on the quiz show. Hence the title, Q&A, Questions and Answers. Now, I've often been asked, why did I choose to base my book on a quiz show? The simple answer to that is that I wanted to write something offbeat. I did not want to write the usual generational family saga which Indian writers have specialized in stretching from 1860 to 1970 or a magical realist fable with talking monkeys. And that's when it struck me, why not tap into the global phenomena of the syndicated televised quiz show? After all, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire was a top rated show in a staggering 110 countries across the world, including India and the United States. The issue was, who should be my contestant? Now, I was writing this novel when I was posted in Britain. And in Britain, there was a big scandal about a certain major called Major Charles Ingram. He was a major in the British Army. He appeared on the British edition of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And he won a million pounds. But later on, the producers discovered that he had actually cheated his way through the quiz show by having his wife and a college lecturer be present in the audience, and they were relaying the correct answers to, uh, to him through coded coughs. So he and his wife were arrested. They received 18-month prison sentences suspended for two years. The last I heard, he had quit the army and become a novelist. <laughs> so I thought to myself, if someone as well-educated as a major in the British Army someone of as high a social standing as a, military, a British military officer can be accused of cheating, why not have a contestant who would definitely be accused of cheating? 
Because you see, we have this latent conceit that those of us who go to schools and universities and read newspapers, we, we know. And those who have not had the good fortune of getting a proper education, you know, like the servants, the maids, the sweepers, the cleaners, we think they don't know anything. So the inspiration for Q&A actually came from a news report, which I had read in 1999, about a project called Hole in the Wall. Now, this was a very interesting project, which was uh, carried out by a group of computer scientists working in the NIIT computer facility in Delhi. They were in the NIIT campus, and right adjoining the campus was the Kalkaji slum. It's a huge slum in Delhi. And there was a common wall between the campus and the slum. So they literally carved a hole in the wall, and they placed a freely accessible computer with a touch screen facing the slum. And then they observed. They said, let's see what happens. And they discovered that that computer became a big hit in the slum. And especially the slum kids, they took to it like, a, like fish takes to water. And within three months, the slum kids were using that computer you know, to, to gather information, to, to navigate, uh, to, to find out uh, more stuff about the world. When I read about it, to me it felt incredible. These are slum kids, kids who have never gone to school, who don't know a word of English, you know, who, who don't have teachers, and they are able to manipulate a computer entirely on their own. So this revealed to me that perhaps there is some innate ability in all of us, which, given the right opportunity, can surface. And I thought uh, to myself, I said, if a slum kid can start using a computer, then a slum kid can also participate in a brain quiz and win. So I juxtaposed these two themes of a game show and of a contestant who has no formal education, who has street knowledge as opposed to book knowledge. And that's how Q&A was born. Now for me, the quiz show was also a template to tell the story of modern India. Now India is a land of great contradictions and paradoxes. You have some of the richest people in the world living in India. In a recent survey, it was discovered that India now uh, is the fourth uh, country with the highest number of billionaires after the US, uh, Germany, and China. But you also have some of the poorest people in the world living in India. You have the second biggest pool of technical and scientific manpower in the world, but also the biggest number of illiterates. And what unites these diverse and different parts of India, I suppose are you know, maybe Bollywood, a love of cricket, and above all, the ceaseless desire to better your life. Even a poor rickshawala who earns less than $2 a day is saving up and trying to send his children to a good school so that they may get the break in life that he did not get. And that is why I always say that the slums of Delhi and Mumbai are not places of hopelessness and despair. They are teeming with energy, with ingenuity. My protagonist, Ram Muhammad Thomas, embodies the can-do spirit of India. He is an everyman. He could be the servant who cleans your house, the street urchin who washes your windscreen at a traffic intersection, the waiter who serves you butter chicken in a restaurant. He has never gone to school, but he is conscious of his surroundings. He registers everything and learns from every situation. And he draws upon his store of street wisdom to unlock not only the keys to the questions on the quiz show, but to life itself. Because life is the best teacher in the world. And those who graduate from the school of hard knocks know that every moment in life is meaningful and significant. There are no unnecessary experiences. So seen from this perspective, the message of my novel is a simple one, that each one of us creates his or her own luck, and he who strives wins. So when I was writing this novel in the summer of 2003, I knew that I was onto a good thing, that the idea was fresh, that the narrative structure was unique, but I had no idea that this message of humanity and hope would one day resonate with readers from across the world, and that it would get translated into 44 languages, get made into an audio book, a radio play, and a film called Slumdog Millionaire. Now the film people, that is Film Ford, approached me for the film rights in 2004. That is one year before the novel has even been published. And that surprised me. BBC asked me in an interview, you know, when you were writing this novel, could you imagine it as a film? And I said, I couldn't even imagine it as a book. You know, as a first-time writer, what are the chances of getting published? So to be approached by Film 4 was a surprise. And then I met Simon Beaufoy, who was going to write the screenplay. And he told me, Vikas, I love your novel, but your entire novel will not work as a film. Because we don't have the budget, but I'm making you a promise. I will remain faithful to the soul of your novel. So I knew then that the body might get mangled. Now, once the film was released, it literally took the world by storm. 
winning four Golden Globes, seven BAFTAs, and a staggering eight Oscars. And since then, everyone has been asking me this one question. What do you feel about the film adaptation of Q&A? And it's a ticklish question for me, in the sense, I have a certain distance from the film. Uh, Q&A is my book, but Slumdog Millionaire is not my film. It is Danny Boyle's film. Even as I was debating how to approach this subject, I came across a brilliant parallel in India. A Bengali writer, a famous Bengali writer called Mani Shankar Mukherjee, had one of his novels made into a film by none other than Satyajit Ray. And Shankar was asked exactly the same question. Shankar, your book is now a film. What do you think about the film? And Shankar thought about it, and then he said, you know, giving permission for your book to be made into a film is a bit like giving your daughter away in marriage. <laughs> the first thing that happens is your daughter acquires a new surname. So Q&A gets remarketed as Slumdog Millionaire. And the second thing that happens is you acquire a son-in-law, namely the film. And then he said, remember, in India, you never ever speak ill of your son-in-law in public. <laughs> so you will not hear me carping about how the film is different from my book. You will not hear me say that while my book was about luck, the film is explicitly about destiny. The fact of the matter is that Slumdog Millionaire works as a film. The Wall Street Journal described it as the film world's first globalized masterpiece. And it is easy to see why. With its timely setting of a swiftly globalizing India, and combining it with timeless melodrama in a hard-working orphan who withstands all manner of setbacks, Slumdog Millionaire plays like Charles Dickens for the 21st century. It helped, of course, that it was based on a great story called Q&A. <laughs> now, anything which becomes a runaway hit attracts its fair share of controversy as well. Inevitably, there was a backlash against the film's success, criticism that it exploited India's poor and played to Western preconceptions of India as a lawless dump. Some critics described it as poverty porn. The Slum Dwellers Association of India even went to the extent of filing a lawsuit against the filmmakers, saying that Danny Boyle and Simon Beaufoy, by calling their film Slum Dog Millionaire, have named everyone living in the slum as a dog. They lost the case, of course, but they didn't give up. They went and they bought two dogs, and they named them Simon and Danny. Danny. <laughs> I think they missed the point. Slumdog Millionaire is a film that neither trivializes poverty nor degrades it. It is not a documentary on slum life. The slum is merely a backdrop to a compelling human story of courage and determination, of the passion, resilience, and dynamism of the slum kids. Another reason for Slumdog's success was its timing. You see, this, was this film was released in 2008, just after the Lehman shock, at a time of enormous economic uncertainty. People were losing jobs, people were losing hope, and comes across this film called Slumdog Millionaire. Its effect stemmed from its central message. What's the central message of Slumdog Millionaire? That hope makes life bright. Now that message may be corny, but compare that message to its main Oscar competitor in 2009, a film called The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. What was the central message of Benjamin Button? Death makes life sad. You pick, which one, would you, which one would you choose? Now, this is also a film in which the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That is why not a single actor was nominated for any of the acting awards. Yet, Danny Boyle was able to take the best out of every single member of the team. The film has many strengths, but I will single out three. One, the absolutely wonderful acting by the child actors. Two, A.R. Rahman's brilliant score combining elements of hip-hop, pop, and reggae, and combining it with an Indian sensibility. And finally, Anthony Dodd Mantle's amazing cinematography, which has captured Mumbai like it has never been captured before. At a time when most, most blockbuster movies summon up worlds from a computer-generated palette, Danny Boyle and his team made Slumdog feel real. And yet, it is important to bear in mind that Slumdog Millionaire is only a film. It offers a slice of Indian life, an extreme slice of Indian life, but it does not seek to portray that slice as the essence of India, and neither should it be seen as such. India, I have always maintained, is too complex a country for any one book or film to capture its essence. In fact, in my opinion, Peter Bradshaw of The Guardian hit the nail on the head when he said that this film depends for its full enjoyment on not being taken too seriously. Now, when your first book becomes a big hit, the pressure on the next book goes much beyond the dreaded second book syndrome. 
My publishers dropped hints that perhaps I could consider writing another book with the same characters, which could be called The Continuing Adventures of Ram Muhammad Thomas. But I rejected the idea. I said, I don't want to be a Spider-Man franchise. <laughs> I wanted to push myself as a writer, to explore my own boundaries, and to experiment with both voice and structure. So I decided to write a novel called Six Suspects, which was published in 2008. Now, Six Suspects has been described as a murder mystery, but I think it is more than that. It's really a polyphonic narrative crafted around the anatomy of a murder, the murder of a playboy called Vivek Rai, the son of the Home Minister of India's most populous state, Uttar Pradesh. Now, when Vivek Rai was 17 years old, his father gifted him a BMW. He took it out for a spin at night, and while coming back, he mowed down six homeless people who were sleeping on the pavement. Case comes to trial, father gets into the act, nobody remembers seeing the BMW, he's acquitted. When he's 20 years old, he goes to a wildlife sanctuary in Rajasthan and he shoots dead two black bucks. Now, black bucks are a protected species of deer. He's arrested once again, but within six months, the only eyewitness, the forest ranger who had seen him shoot the black bucks, dies mysteriously. He's acquitted once again. When he's 25 years old, he decides to have his birthday party at a trendy pub on the Delhi Jaipur Highway. At 2 a.m., he staggers to the bar and asks for a drink. The bartender is a young lady, a doctoral student at Delhi University. She says, I'm sorry, sir, the bar is now closed. I can't give you a drink. How dare you deny me? He gets into a rage, takes out his revolver, pumps two bullets into her. She dies on the spot. Again, he's arrested. The case drags on for seven years. But at the end of those seven years, he's acquitted once again. So to celebrate this acquittal, he holds a massive party at his farmhouse. 300, 400 guests are there. Everybody is enjoying themselves. You know, liquor is flowing. There's a, uh, there's a band which is belting out the latest hits. Everybody's having a great time. When suddenly, the lights go off and a shot rings out. 10 seconds later, when somebody switches on the lights, they discover that Vicky Rai, Vivek Rai, has been shot dead. So the police are on traffic control duty outside the farmhouse. They immediately seal the farmhouse. They don't allow any of the guests to go. And they search all the guests. And in that search, six guests are discovered with guns. So remember, if you go to a party with a gun and the host gets shot, you become a suspect. <laughs> so the rest of the novel, what I have told you, happens in the first 10 pages of the novel. The rest of the novel is really the backstories of these six suspects. Who are these people? What were they doing in the farmhouse that night? Why did they have guns on them? Which one of them is the murderer? Now, the, through the medium of these six suspects, my idea is to give you six different versions of India. You know, versions from insiders and versions from outsiders. There are two outsiders also as part of these six suspects. One is a tribesman from the Andaman Islands, people who still hunt with bows and arrows. He comes to mainland India in search of a stolen relic. But the most interesting outsider is a chap called Larry Page, who is a forklift operator in a Walmart store in Waco, Texas, who comes to India in search of a mail-order bride and who thinks that the Star Spangled Banner was written by Stevie Wonder? <laughs> so Q&A began with the lines, I have been arrested for winning a quiz show. Six suspects began with, not all deaths are equal. There is a caste system, even in murder. And my latest novel, The Accidental Apprentice, which came out in the States last year, begins with, in life, you never get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. So as you can guess, it is set in the world of big business. The story traces the journey of a simple 23-year-old sales girl called Sapna Sinha, who has made an amazing offer by a billionaire industrialist, Vinay Mohanacharya, out of the blue when he, said, when he tells her, I want to make you the CEO of my $10 billion company, provided you pass seven tests from the textbook of life. So the novel opens with Sapna in a police lockup on charge of murder, and much of the novel is a flashback into the seven tests in which she goes from a carb-dominated village in Haryana to a reality TV show in Mumbai to a kidney transplant racket in Gurgaon. So the seven tests are essentially a 21st century take on the ancient theme of a rite of passage to adulthood. Sapna goes through a trial by fire to discover herself in a way. She represents the modern confident woman of India, one who is not constrained by the gender stereotyping of the past. In fact, if there's one thing emblematic of the new India, it is that nothing is impossible. So as you can see, what I write about is very different from my day job. But I believe that is one of the charms of fiction, that you can invent a whole new world and populate it with characters who belong only to your imagination. Those of you who have read my books will find a familiar strain in them. 
of ordinary persons thrust into extraordinary situations. Sometimes I feel it is also a metaphor for my own life, post the extraordinary sexes of my debut novel Q&A. Even though Slumdog Millionaire won eight Oscars, I have no distinct sense of personal achievement. All I can say is that I love books and I enjoy the opportunity of contributing to that fascinating and magical process by which a writer's consciousness is transferred onto the readers. Henry James defined the purpose of a novel as being to help the human heart to know itself better. I cannot pretend that reading my novels will help you know your heart better, but they will certainly help you to know my country better. And believe me, India is critical to the future of the world. Where else will you find a country where 1.25 billion people are trying to determine their destiny through the medium of democracy? A country that while addressing primary issues like health, shelter and literacy is also simultaneously able to compete at a global level in technology, business and culture. A country which is blazing a path to become the world's third largest economy while also trying to lift more than 300 million people out of absolute poverty. As a writer, I find these contradictions fascinating. You will not find elephants and maharajas in my novels, nor palaces and yoga, but you will discover an India that is vibrant, dynamic, pulsating, and confidently marching forward, taking everyone with it, rich and poor alike. So those of you who have read my books, thank you for living in my world, and an even bigger thank you to each and every one of you for allowing me this evening to live in yours. Thank you. I think it's a small enough auditorium, people can... <clears throat> Is there a name? Okay. Okay. Do you think Indian literature has changed as it's grown from being based on traditional English literature at, to being based on world and, and international literature? Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, you know, uh, 15 years ago, if you, looked, if you went to a bookshop in Delhi and you went to the Indian literature section, you know, you would find barely seven or eight authors. You know, it was the usual suspects, Arundhati Roy, uh, Kushwan Singh, Muluk Raj Anand, uh, Raja Rao, you know, people like those. But today, if you go to a bookshop and you go to the Indian literature section, I mean, you will have hundreds of writers there. And because there's been a real efflorescence of Indian writing in English in particular, uh, you know, we are now experimenting with new genres. You know, 10 years ago, science fiction fantasy did not exist in India, but now it does. Graphic novels did not exist in India, now they do. Uh, and of course, now this whole mythology, you know, I mean, that has become a genre in itself uh, with the Shiva trilogy and people are exploring Indian, Indian myths and Indian legends, Indian gods and Indian goddesses. So, you know, of course, I'm not saying that the quality is consistent throughout, but the important thing is at least the reader is spoiled for choice. Now you have a choice. So, you know, just as a bookshop looks in America now, a bookshop looks in India now where you have all kinds of range of uh, genres available, and it's for the reader to uh, you know, pick and choose whatever, whichever suits uh, his or her tastes. Yeah. One person at the back. How long did you research for, um, in order to... Yep. You know, I gave a talk in Mumbai uh, soon after Q&A came out, and uh, after my talk was over in the Q&A session, a lady got up and she says, uh, Mr. Swaroop, how many years did you live in Dharavi? And I said, why are you asking me this question? She says, because I live in Dharavi, the largest slum in Asia. And uh, you know, reading your book, I could smell Dharavi. So obviously you had a very authentic, uh, you know, uh, I mean your life experience in Dharavi must have been very authentic. And I said, I'm very sorry to disappoint you, but I have not been to Dharavi. So I'd actually not been to the slum at all. Uh, I mean, I had researched it, but I had not been to the slum. So, I mean, the lady was very disappointed. 
she said that, you know, as if the scales had come down uh, or, or whatnot. Uh, so she said, at least would you visit Dharavi now? And then I visited Dharavi. And of course, uh, you know, the research uh, could, you know, what had happened was I had been to slums. I had not been to Dharavi, but I had been to slums in India. So I, in my mind's eye, I thought, okay, what would Dharavi be like? You multiply what I had seen with a factor of 1,000 or 10,000, and maybe that would be uh, Dharavi. And well, Dharavi met my expectations and exceeded my expectations also because Dharavi is not a monolith. It's not that, you know, it's just a place of squalor, you know, and uh, bad sewage. Dharavi is also a place of industry. You know, uh, majority of the watch strap buckles are made in Dharavi now. So, you know, there's a thriving industry, the leather trade. You know, the center of the leather trade in Mumbai is Dharavi now. And Dharavi also now, there is a high class Dharavi and there's a lower class Dharavi. So Dharavi is, has, is, is also become a microcosm of India, where, you know, you have people, you have the fresh immigrants, those who have just come in from a village and, you know, are trying to find a, make a life for themselves and they cannot afford the high rents of the city and they create a temporary, you know, tarpaulin uh, tent and they start living there. And you have those who have made it and yet like the uh, sense of community that Dharavi provides and continue to stay there. So research is important. I mean, the fact that this lady was hoodwinked into believing that I had lived in Dharavi meant that my research at least was good. But beyond that, I think, you know, what you really need is the quality of empathy. Because uh, in order to create the character of Ram Muhammad Thomas, I had to imagine life as Ram Muhammad Thomas would have imagined it. You know, uh, someone who does not know whether he will get a next meal tomorrow, whether he will live tomorrow or die tomorrow. You, ha you know, you had to experience that kind of a, you know, uh, life-changing experience from the perspective of this 18-year-old waiter for, uh, you know, for my writing to reflect that kind of uh, lived experience. So it, did not, it was not lived experience, but psychologically it was a lived experience for me at least. Yeah. Yes. You know, I believe a truly great novel, uh, you know, has nothing autobiographical about the writer <laughs> inside it. Uh, look, I mean, there are writers who write very autobiographically. You know, there are some writers who have just written one novel because, you know, it, the, their life experiences went into that novel and, you know, they wrung themselves dry and nothing was left for them to create a second work. What I write about is, as I said, very different from my personal life experiences. In the sense, I have never lived in a slum. I have not so far murdered someone, yet I can write about <laughs> murders <laughs> and things like that. So uh, uh, for me, the important thing is to be consistent with the fictional world that I'm creating. You know, the good thing is, even though I'm a civil servant, uh, my government allows me the liberty to create in my spare time, as long as it is made clear that, you know, what you are creating is you know, is your creation, it has nothing to do with the government of India. So I have that liberty at least, and then, and this means that I don't have to write with a hesitant pen. I can be uh, faithful and true to the characters that I'm creating, to the ecosystem uh, of the fictional universe that I'm creating. And that is what I try to, what I, what I aspire for. Yes. So as, uh, as undergrads, we struggle to finish a five-page paper in a week. Um, <laughs> I cannot fathom writing it, uh, a whole novel in two months. Can you just run us through your writing process and where the motivation to continue stems from? Yeah, well, uh, you know, when I give these uh, so-called motivational speeches, I always emphasize on one thing. I said, if I can write, then so can anyone else. Because I believe creativity is not something that is confined to a select few. It is there in everyone. It's just that in some people it remains dormant because they have not learned to orient the antenna of their mind. I mean, the clearest example I gave is of Newton. You know, apples had been falling on people's heads for centuries. But why did it take Newton to discover the universal laws of gravitation? Why? Because Newton was curious. As William Hazlitt said, you know, uh, apples had been falling on people's heads, but Newton asked, why? So the first thing that you need to be creative is curiosity. Unless you are curious about the world, you would not want to imagine it differently. And every work of fiction begins with, what if? You know, what if, uh, you know, Emory University becomes the top-ranked university in the United States? And then you start thinking uh, in, a, in a different uh, line altogether, in a different way altogether. So the first, so I, my formula is the three C's. The first C is curiosity. The second C is confidence. You have to have the confidence that what you are creating has worth outside your immediate circle. You know, New York Times did a survey in which they discovered that 81% of Americans believe they have a book inside them. 
Well, most of the time it should remain inside them. <laughs> but if you believe that your grandmother's story has relevance outside your immediate family, then take the risk and find out. A culture of risk aversion is not good for creativity. So you, and that is why testing becomes very important. You know, the peer circle, you know, because every first time writer believes that, oh, I have written the next Pulitzer Prize winning novel or a Nobel Prize winning novel, but many, very often that's not the case. Only through objective advice can you know the true worth of what you are creating. For me, the, you know, how I do it is, I want to read what I have written as a reader, not as a writer. And that is why, for me, the trick is to read after a gap, when I have no immediate memory of having written it. Because otherwise, you know, those words uh, will, will be there in my short-term memory. And uh, I, would, uh, I cannot then say that I have written something wrong, because why would I write it otherwise? But when I approach it after a gap of, let's say, a couple of weeks, then when I read it, then I do not have the immediate memory of having written it, and then I can approach it as a, write, as a reader. And then I can see whether it is good stuff or bad stuff. And sometimes, you know, you say, oh my God, it's not, it's not uh, looking well at all, and you, and you throw it away. So the second C is confidence, and the third C is the computer for the research. Because research is very important. Without, without uh, an authentic backdrop that you need to create, the reader will not invest in your, in your book. Because what is, when you read a novel, it's actually a willing suspension of disbelief. When you enter the world of Ram Muhammad Thomas, you're actually willing yourself to believe that there is an actual boy called Ram Muhammad Thomas who is participating in an actual game show called Who Will Will Abinion and who has answered all these questions. Because if that willing suspension of disbelief is not there, then as I said, you would not engage with that novel at all. So the computer is very important to help you do the research and I have thanked Google, in fact, in my first book for making research so much faster. Otherwise, I would have had to sit, I could write this novel in two months only because of Google. Otherwise, I would have had to sit in a library you know, read through maybe 500 books and then find that 499 of them don't have the stuff that I need. But this way, I can just search something and of course, there also a lot of stuff comes up, but then at least, you know, it's all there on your desktop and uh, you can pick and choose what you want and what you don't. So these are the three keys to success as a writer, according to me. Curiosity, confidence, and a computer. Yeah, a follow-up? Um, it's a separate question. Um, so you mentioned wearing like the two hats of being a diplomat and a writer. How has your experiences as a diplomat, like living in different places in the world, influenced your writing? Well, all three of my novels have been based in India, but all three novels were written while I was posted abroad. The first one when I was living in London, the second when I was living in South Africa, the third when I was living in Japan. So uh, I, I wouldn't say that uh, overtly, uh, you know, my experiences in those countries have gone into my novels because they have not. The novels are very much, uh, you know, rooted uh, to the Indian reality. But I suppose, you know, when you write, uh, there are lots, uh, it's a very mysterious process and a lot of the stuff happens in a subconscious way. You know, a conversation that I may have had in Japan may feed into a novel. A person that I met on the street may feed into the novel as a character in India, for instance. So these things happen, I think, at a subliminal level. You're not actually even aware of it, but you know, you file this away in some dark recess of your mind and where it triggers, uh, you know, what kind of a thought process, uh, you know, that emerges only in the process of writing. So I would say that, yes, I have been influenced by all three places that I have lived in. Uh, it may not appear overtly in my writing, but in a subconscious way, certainly uh, it has impacted. Japan, for instance, I, I was impressed uh, and struck by the, by the sense of serenity that, uh, that was there in Japan. And of course, I was also there at the time of the earthquake, you know, the March 11 earthquake. So that was also there. So I think all these factors eventually uh, go into, uh, when you write, you need a particular space and you need a particular time, and that space and time is determined by your local conditions only. You know, you may write about what is happening in India, but if your mind is in a ferment where, wherever you are, you won't be able to create. So I think local conditions are important uh, just to kickstart that process of creativity. Yeah. You talked about the juxtaposition in economic status that happens in India. As um, a law student, I've done research on the innovation and industrialization of in India, specifically with generic drug manufacturing. And it seems to be an obvious push in increasing that industrialization. Do you think it's more important to industrialize in India or to focus on education to help 
decrease that gap in economic status? Well, both are not mutually incompatible. I mean, there's nobody can say that education and industrialization are against each other. In fact, industrialization will be helped if you have skilled people, because after all, who will provide the labor for all those factories? Now, as you know, the new government in India has a massive program called Make in India. It's the aim is to make India into a manufacturing hub. And for that to happen, you have to create a full ecosystem. You know, uh, manufacturing does not happen in a vacuum. You need labor laws, uh, you need uh, skilled individuals, you need infrastructure, you need good roads, you need good ports, you need electricity, you need water, and you need all these conditions. Uh, but I think the most important ingredient is the skilled people, because without uh, people with skills, you know, who would run those factories? So there also, we have started a Skills India initiative where the idea is to train uh, you know, as many people as possible because don't forget, by 2030, India will have the largest workforce in the world, one million people. That's larger than the workforce of the United States and the EU combined. So you know, in order to cater for that workforce, you have, to skill, uh, you have to provide skills to these people. So I think education is very, very important and so is industrialization. to meet the movie star. Did that come from your imagination or uh, based on a true story? Uh, I, I didn't get it. Uh, there's a scene at the beginning of the movie where... A, a oh, he boy... jumps into the pile of shit. Yes. <laughs> no, that's, that's not in my book at all. Uh, that's, I don't know from where Danny Boyle uh, got it, but it's not there in my book at all. Yeah. Do you have a favorite book? Anything that you've read recently that you've really liked or an author that you'd recommend? Well, I, as I said, I read so many authors over the years. Uh, I wouldn't uh, say that one particular favorite, but as I said, I was a great sucker for mystery novels. And 99% of the time, I would guess the murderer also. But I, as I said, I read anything and everything that I could lay my hands upon, you know, so uh, I was very much struck by Bram Stoker's Dracula, for instance. It was the scariest story that I had read in my life, uh, you know, and uh, um, in fact, uh, I would be hesitant to turn the pages uh, because, you know, uh, the, the whole scene uh, I could imagine uh, in my head, for instance. So uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula is certainly one book uh, that uh, impressed me a lot. Uh, then John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men, and that is another uh, absolutely wonderful, uh, wonderful story. Uh, Fitzgerald's A Great Gatsby. Uh, so, as I said, I read a number of authors over the years, and for me, the important thing was a story which remains with me after I have finished the book. You know, that for me is the, I mean, there the are airport thrillers where, you know, the plot is everything. You, once you have uh, come to the, you've understood what the plot mechanic is, you throw away the novel because the characters don't engage you. But you have novels which the characters remain in your head, even after you have turned the last page and you keep thinking about them, sometimes even for years wondering what became of their life, what happened to them, you know, uh, and things like that. Of course, there are writers who believe in being very, very, what should I say, uh, ambiguous and uh, leaving re readers sort of tantalizingly close to a resolution but without a resolution. Uh, you know, Paul Auster is one of those writers, an American author who does not believe in resolutions. Uh, I believe that a reader must get his money's worth and there must be resolution at the end. I don't want them to go puzzling into the night. What happened? Did they get married? Did he die of cancer? What exactly happened? So I, I believe in resolution. India is often um, labeled or stereotyped as a place with much corruption. Um, in your eyes, what can be done to change that perception? I think we are, we are doing a lot to change that. I mean, you have, as you know, we have the Right to Information Act, which is a revolutionary piece of legislation. You can ask any public servant, uh, you know, any question about his public dealing, and he's duty-bound to reply to you within 28 days. Then there's an uh, e-tendering. You know, all major procurements by the government have now to be tendered on the website. So everybody has access to it. There's no longer crony, uh, you know, that you do a closed door uh, kind of a thing within, with four people and all. Look, corruption is an issue that exists in, in all societies. It's not something endemic only to, uh, to India or to developing countries. It happens even in developed societies and things like that. Important thing is, is there accountability? Is there, if the corruption is discovered, is there penalties or not? That is the real test of a democracy. And there I think you will, you, you see that in India. In fact, the ultimate test is uh, governments are removed uh, if, uh, if people have a perception that, you know, things are not going in the right direction. 
So I think we are taking a number of steps to ensure that you know, we become more transparent, we become more open, government processes become uh, less arcane and more accessible, and the, and the public should have a, you know, a direct stake in knowing uh, how their money is being spent. Um. I'm an undergrad at an Emory. I'm not a major in creative writing, but I'm taking my eighth one this semester. And like the hardest part of writing your own work is like knowing when to finish it. So as an author of like several like very well-known books, how do you know like when your book's been finished and like what kind of courage does it take to send it to the publisher? Very, very interesting question. This is one of the most interesting questions I've been asked. Well, you see, for me, it's very easy because I begin with the ending. And then I work backwards. Because for me, I always want to give a surprise to the reader, you know, a shock value uh, at the end. And for that, to embed that surprise, you have to work backwards. You can't just, you know, at the last minute say, hey, let's make this guy the murderer. You know, it won't work that way because you have to be honest. You have to give the reader the same clues that are available to you as the writer. Then only the reader will feel that it was a, uh, you know, it was an honest uh, whodunit, uh, so to speak. So I work backwards. I begin with the ending and then work backwards and then uh, you know, uh, come to the beginning. So for me, the ending is known from day one. Uh, but having said that, sometimes uh, endings change. I mean, for my latest book, I had a different ending in mind. And then when I started writing it, that ending didn't appeal to me. And then I decided I, I have to change it. So I think writing, that's the great thing. Many people ask me this question that when you start writing, how much of the novel is inside your head? Because you know, we find it very difficult to write the whole novel because you know, how can I retain everything in my head? And I say, look, when I write a novel, I have only 10 to 15% in my head. The rest, 85%, emerges in the process of writing. I only have the major milestones. I, I know that I have, what, two or three characters, and this is going to be their life resolutions, you know, how they will go from point A to point B to point C. But beyond that, some side characters emerge, you know, uh, someone who you thought would be a lead character becomes a minor character, somebody you thought would be a minor character becomes a major character. And most importantly, the characters that you have created become people, and they start talking to you. And that is when you know, the real joy of, uh, of writing happens. I mean, of course, it can be frustrating because sometimes your novel is not progressing. And you know, that's what's called writer's block. But that is actually your character telling you that you have taken a wrong turn somewhere. Take a deep breath, retrace your steps, and maybe take a different turn. We have time for one more question. Yes, OK. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry I came in late. That's my loss. So um, I'm like I get to ask a question. So you spoke about suspension of disbelief, and of course, across uh, the history of literature, there's a number of writers who push that too far with very improbable twists and turns. So how do you know to uh, find that sweet spot between so improbable, I'm sorry, not on this planet, and oh, okay, that's actually within the realm of possibility, although a bit uh, jarring of a turn there. Well, that's the art of the fiction writer. I mean, and you know, Ernest Hemingway said that every writer must have that inbuilt bullshit detector, you know, and, and that's the important thing. You have to know whether, you know, this works or it doesn't work, and, and that's where books fail, because the writer felt that he was being very smart, but the reader did not feel that that was being smart. The reader thought that was being foolish. So I think that's something, you know, that every writer has to take, you know, their own calls what works, what does not work, whether this is too improbable. When I'll just give you my personal experience. When I wrote Q&A, you know, actually it's two novels in one. There is the novel about the game show. What's happening on this game show, you know, where these crooked people are running this, uh, you know, offering a billion rupees, uh, $16 million as prize money, but actually ensuring that nobody is going to win it. And there is the life story of my protagonist, Ram Muhammad Thomas. And I have juxtaposed the two. I'm revealing the private life of my protagonist through the public spectacle of the quiz show. And I thought to myself, as I said, am I becoming too gimmicky? You know, this framework of this quiz show and Ram Muhammad Thomas appearing on this. Shouldn't I just write the story of Ram Muhammad Thomas, let there be no quiz show? And I thought, you know, this was a, a genuine question. I thought, will the readers uh, get turned away? Will they feel this is too gimmicky? But then I said, the reader is going to be interested because Ram Muhammad Thomas has won a billion rupees. That is why the reader is interested in his life in the first place. If he is just another ordinary street kid, then the reader is not interested. But this is a street kid who has appeared in a brain quiz and won. And that is why the reader is interested. And then I decided, no, I have to retain both these strands. So as I said, you know, you, do, you have this internal discussion, your conversation with yourself, and you come to your own conclusions. 
Thank, well, thank you, you very much. It's been a wonderful audience and uh, great to uh, have had this opportunity.